Hi, everyone. As president of the World Association for Veterinary Dermatology, it's my honor to present the 2020 Hugo Schindelka Award and Medal. Hugo Schindelka was a teacher at the Vienna Veterinary School in the late 1800s and early 1900s. He was the first one to bring the scientific approach to veterinary dermatology and therefore is widely regarded as the father of veterinary dermatology. This award is only given every four years at the World Congresses. Nominations are taken from all over the world by WAVD and then an independently appointed panel chooses the recipient of the award and it's actually based on excellence in scholarship and publication. The recipient also gives the Hugo Schindelka Memorial Lectureship at the Congress. The 2020 recipient has for decades demonstrated excellence in scholarship and publications in clinical dermatology, in clinical research, and in dermatohistopathology. Uh, over the years, he's made contributions in all of these areas. He's probably most noted for the fact that he has educated by his continuing education presentations, more general practitioners all over the globe in the specialty of veterinary dermatology than just about anyone else. On a personal note, our recipient is a wonderful individual. He's honest, he's passionate about dermatology, he's open, he always shares his time when other, with others. And as a matter of fact, also on a personal note, he's a pretty mean electric guitar player in the Yeasty Boys Band in the United States. He's also one of the best people that you'll see at a meeting for giving great big hugs to everybody that he sees. And I wish I could be there to give him this award because I know I'd get a great big hug from him and I'd get a great big hug back. So it's actually my pleasure to be able to present the Hugo Schindelka Memorial Award and Medal for 2020 to Dr. Danny Scott. Danny, thank you for all your contributions to the specialty and we look forward to hearing your lecture during the meeting. Much congratulations. Sisters and brothers in veterinary dermatology, I'm going to read this to you. I used to be able to memorize all of these things. Now, I often can't remember what I had for breakfast several hours previously. When Ken Kwachka called to tell me that I was the 2020 recipient of the Hugo Schindelka Award, I was flabbergasted and very humbled. When you do what you love and you love what you do, you don't think about awards. Now I have received awards in the past, some of the most precious to me being the Norden Distinguished Teaching Award from my veterinary students, the New York State Veterinary Medical Society Outstanding Service to Veterinary Medicine Award from the practitioners that I worked so closely with for so many years, honorary life membership in the American College of Veterinary Pathologists, the Frank Crawl Award for Achievements in Veterinary Dermatology from the American Academy of Veterinary Dermatology. The University of California School of Veterinary Medicine Alumni Achievement Award from my old alma mater, the University of California, Davis. And the James Law Professor of Dermatology from my veterinary home for 45 years, Cornell University. Now, like those awards, this one, the Hugo Schindelka Award, is never achieved by oneself. It takes the input, advice, support, encouragement, and sustenance from so many folks. 
I am especially grateful to all my fabulous colleagues over the years, especially Bob Kirk and Bill Miller. All my amazing residents in dermatology and pathology, who I can call my children in derm and path. To my veterinary home for 45 years, Cornell University, and my beloved family, especially my mom, and my wife and soulmate of the last 50 plus years, Chris. My only goals in veterinary dermatology were to do the best I could to share the love of and enthusiasm for this phenomenal specialty. And to maybe, just maybe, advance the frontiers of veterinary dermatology all a millimeter or so. It has been so much fun and such an honor to try to achieve these goals. Thank you so much. Stay well, stay happy, and keep pushing. I love you. Danny, over and out. When I uh, was first contacted by uh, Ken Kwachka, and he told me that I had become the 2020 recipient of the Hugo uh, Schindelka Award, I think my, my first comment was probably, say what? Uh, it's, a, it's a very surprising, unexpected, humbling type of uh, thing to find out about yourself. Um, and then Kenny said, you know, you, you, you need to give us a lecture too. And I said, okay, um, what should I lecture on? And Kenny said, lecture on anything you want. And I said, really? No, that's my kind of lecture. So after I thought about it for two milliseconds, uh, I decided that what might be fun and interesting for us is to look at uh, how my life progressed into and through uh, veterinary dermatology. Because it, as you'll see, it was never anything that would have been predictable at any time of my life, nothing that I thought about, uh, and it was quite a circuitous pathway uh, to eventually get me to our great specialty of veterinary dermatology. Um, not the least surprising part of it was I was, and, and still am, the only member of our family, both sides, who ever went into a medical profession. So uh, it was all quite unexpected. Well, I was born and raised in uh, Los Angeles, California. My earliest experiences in veterinary medicine uh, mimic those of many uh, men and women at that time. You volunteered and if you were lucky, ultimately got salaried to work in a veterinarian's clinic. And you were termed a kennel boy or a kennel girl because you cleaned a whole lot of kennels. And uh, I did that for a number of years before I got into uh, a veterinary school. Um, you would come in like uh, before the sun rose. You'd be all by yourself. You'd clean up all the cages and runs. You'd take the animals out to exercise. You'd feed them. You'd water them. So that by the time the sun came up and the veterinarians came in, uh, you were ready to help them with their chores, uh, hold animals for examination, treatments, vaccinations, and so on. That typically uh, was a 13-hour day, uh, and it went six days a week. You got a break on Sunday because uh, there were no uh, office appointments, of course, but the veterinarians did come in to uh, treat inpatients. So typically, I'd get out after five or six hours on a Sunday. Um, all of this was a uh, small animal, predominantly dogs and cats, um, cows and horses. And well, the only cows I remember seeing before I got into veterinary school were on the huge billboards. 
and they were advertising milk. <laughs> Drink your milk. The only cows I ever saw. Uh, horses, uh, again, the only horses I remember ever seeing uh, were being ridden by cowboys uh, on black and white TV programs. Suffice it to say, I, I was not big in uh, large animal farm animal, farm animal experience when I arrived at veterinary school. I entered veterinary school, University of California, Davis in 1965. Uh, I would uh, enter the uh, veterinary school there at the University of California, Davis in 1967. Now about halfway through veterinary school, of course, was 1969. And uh, 1969 was just the most amazing year. Uh, for instance, of course, that's when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Um, we had the, the first Woodstock, really the only Woodstock. Uh, Ronald Reagan was then governor of California and would, of course, fairly soon become the president of the United States. And uh, President Reagan actually signed my uh, certificate before he became the president. But perhaps the greatest thing to me that happened in 1969 is I married my childhood sweetheart. Well, this is the Hugo Shindelka lecture. And uh, so I'll, I'll start focusing on dermatology a little bit as we go along. Um, Dr. Shindelka, of course, as we all know, was the man who sort of crystallized the whole idea of the specialty of veterinary dermatology in, in clinical practice in his classic textbook from 1903. Uh, I did not meet Dr. Shindelka. Uh, I am old, but I'm not that old. Uh, so let's look a little bit at what was happening early on in veterinary school. I did have some lectures uh, in class at the University of California, Davis, and uh, they included 35 skin diseases. And those 35 skin diseases uh, were in all of the domestic animals that we classically studied in those days, dog, cats, horse, cow, goat, sheep, pig. Uh, how do I remember that there was only 35? Uh, that's because I kept my uh, notes from uh, Durham class. I'm not quite sure why. I guess it was intriguing. Um, and I threw all the other notes away once I graduated and moved to New York. Now, here's one man that I did meet. Uh, that would be Dr. Frank Crowell. And uh, veterinary dermatology just owes a whole bunch of thanks and debt to this man uh, of course, he was a legend in Europe and Czechoslovakia, and then he came over to the United States in 1948 uh, to take over the uh, first university dermatology practice in the United States at the University of Pennsylvania. He was also um, the man who co-authored, as you can see here, my textbook early on. Uh, and that was veterinary dermatology, which included all species. Uh, it was all black and white. And, and it was the first uh, textbook on veterinary dermatology that was written in English. Uh, he was an amazing man. I did meet uh, Dr. Crawl. Um, just a blessing in my life. Now, back to 1969 and away from veterinary medicine for a sec. Remember, I married my childhood, or my high school sweetheart in 1969. And our honeymoon goal was we were gonna hike the John Muir Trail, also known as the High Sierra Loop Trail. And that extends for 211 miles through the High Sierras from essentially Yosemite Valley to the highest point in the United States, uh, other than those peaks in Alaska, and that's Mount Whitman. So our plan was to backpack this uh, and finish it in 21 days, so about 10 miles a day uh, at anywhere from 8 to 13,000 feet elevation. Well, we made it about 86 miles, and uh, my uh, sweetie developed uh, first blisters on multiple uh, areas of her feet. Those blisters unfortunately became infected 
and quite painful. So we had to get off of that trail, which is no easy uh, matter, I might add, and hike out into uh, civilization so she could get treated. So uh, we didn't make 211, we made 86, but man, they were blissful time together because doing that in those days, uh, you could go for days and never see anyone but yourselves. So back to veterinary school, um, uh, I overcame my uh, problems with the cattle and, and horses and others to a certain extent. And uh, in my senior year, uh, my plan had always been for my career is that after graduation, I would go back to Southern California and, and go to work in that practice that I had spent so many years kenneling in and who I knew and respected the, the practitioner so much. And uh, in fact, that's what they expected me to do as well. So back into practice, back into California, back into small animals. Well, somewhere along the line in my senior year, I started having internship thoughts. And internships were a very new concept at that time. So my wife and I got out the uh, in, uh, internship uh, areas that were available, and there weren't very many. And we got out our Rand McNally map and uh, looked it over. And we were interested in what, where are the places we can go for an internship that are not in California and are not in a uh, big city. Because we'd grown up in Los Angeles, we're getting kind of tired of that. We hadn't been out of California yet in our lifetime, really needed to do that. So we looked at the offerings, uh, uh, applied for eight of them. And in those days, it was legal to uh, require you to submit with your application a photograph. And Chris did her best to make me look professional and such. She pulled all my hair back behind my head, put on a hairband, um, shaved, borrowed one of my dad's ties, and, and got one of those pretty little uh, uh, color pictures that you can take in a booth, uh, six for 25 cents at the time, submitted those. And uh, interestingly, I got accepted in six out of the eight internship uh, positions. The only two I did not get accepted in were those where I had to send a photograph. <laughs> not quite sure what that suggests, but there you have it. Um, at graduation in 1971, uh, of course, my family came up to celebrate. And amongst all the things that happened, I remember uh, uttering two very prophet prophetic uh, items, and uh, they were in regards to large animals and to teaching. I told uh, my folks that, well, I'm not quite sure where my career in veterinary medicine will take me ultimately down the line, none of us are, but there are two things I'm very sure of. I never have to look at another large animal as long as I live. Number two, I sure never want to be a teacher. What an awful job that appears to be. Well, keep those in mind because like many such utterances in your youth, uh, they come back to haunt you later on. So my wife and I jumped in our Volkswagen bus and we uh, left the Southern California area down here and headed for uh, beautiful upstate New York and Ithaca because we had decided to take the internship offer from Cornell. Uh, why did we take that one? Quite simple. It was the one that was the farthest away from Southern California. We'd have to drive the longest distance and see the most of our country uh, while we had the opportunity. Well, we left, uh, of course, the lovely warm beaches of Southern California. This is Redondo Beach, very close to where uh, Chris and I grew up. Um, and still one of my favorite birds hanging out in the beach, uh, the pelican. We left all that um, sunshine and warmth and, and the good life. And we moved to uh, Ithaca, New York. And uh, you can see things are a little bit different in Ithaca, uh, especially from about October uh, through May when there's varying degrees of not only cold, but uh, varying depths of snow. Uh, quite pretty, as a matter of fact, if you find prettiness in such images. 
snow covered tree branches, and of course, the sidewalks that you're going to have to shovel and open up. And uh, there's me getting into some of that. You can see it piles up pretty good. Well, my internship at Cornell uh, was interesting. Um, when I got there, uh, remember I was in, interested in going back to private practice, and my major, if you wanted to call it subspecialty interest, was surgery. I didn't want to be a surgeon. I didn't want to go into uh, a surgical residency. They were quite rare at the time, but I thought it would be helpful to my uh, future practice if I developed uh, some skills and such that the other folks didn't have uh, that I might bring back to the practice. But I found out uh, after my uh, internship that surgery really wasn't my thing, uh, interest-wise nor skill-wise. And uh, I'll never forget uh, the recommendation of the surgery faculty. They said, you know, you really need to go out and do a, a, a residency. Um, you are a potential talent, but please, please don't go into surgery. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I get it. So uh, my, my main interest during that internship uh, had evolved into uh, the mysteries uh, of internal medicine. So I needed to get into a, a residency in internal medicine. Uh, they were quite, uh, they were quite competitive at that time. Uh, I was fortunate enough to become a resident in internal medicine at Cornell, but things are never what you think they're going to be. Um, when I started my residency, Almost 24 to 48 hours later, the faculty member in internal medicine that uh, I uh, respected and was planning on working with and learning from announced that uh, uh, he was going to the University of Georgia Veterinary School. So I lost a uh, potential mentor and I became service chief of an internal medicine service because there was nobody else. And uh, if you've never been in charge of an internal medicine service and you've just finished your internship, then you have no idea how angst-ridden, overwhelming, crushing <laughs> your days can be day after day after day. Uh, th at that time, specialization hadn't developed. And so internal medicine basically saw everything except ophthalmology and surgery. So we did the oncology, we did the cardiology. Uh, we actually took and read our own um, x-rays. Uh, we did our own anesthesia. Uh, we were the intensive care unit service. Uh, and quite annoyingly at that time, 50% of my caseload was dermatology. And of course, most people who go into internal medicine uh, do not want to see dermatology as a major component of their case material. Anyway, I uh, enjoyed my time in internal medicine in spite of the dermatology, and when it finished, then it was decision time. Specialty practices were uh, becoming uh, available, and I could uh, go into the specialty practice of internal medicine, uh, or I could uh, stay at the university in internal medicine. Um, Specialty practice offered me about $42,000 a year. University practice offered me $18,000 a year. <laughs> so clearly the economic impetus was to go into practice. Unfortunately, remember that prophecy I had uh, told years ago? Uh, teaching, turns out, had become one of the most rewarding and interesting and enjoyable parts of my career to that point. And so uh, it was really the teaching, not to mention the exposure, of course, to other specialists that uh, kept me at the university, if you will. So I accepted a position in internal medicine, assistant professor at Cornell. Uh, you can see I was in that position for a few years. Um, during that time, 
initially, I always felt that dermatology was in my way, making my life miserable, uh, because, uh, you know, it's just a bunch of unknown stuff. It's, it's not fatal. It's not cruel. We can't do a whole lot of uh, uh, procedural and hematologic gymnastics with it, as usual. Uh, but as time went on, uh, it became more like a black hole. Uh, so many of the diseases, remember, we had, I had learned about 35, there are a few more now, uh, but so many of the cases we saw were just a black hole. Uh, our, our most favorite diagnoses were chronic seborrhea and chronic allergy. And uh, of course, that wasn't very satisfying after a while. I, I started getting more and more interested in perhaps diving into the black hole and making a teeny tiny difference. Um, Problem was I was an internist. So about the time I'd wanna go dig into literature, human or otherwise, uh, on some skin case I was seeing, uh, there was another uh, ketoacidotic dog in IC. There was another renal failure. There was another status epilepsy. On and on and on. And so eventually internal medicine was getting in my way. <laughs> And more than that, as practiced in those days, it was just wearing me out. Remember, we saw uh, all the organ systems except surgery and opto, and we did all the ICU, and uh, there was only two of us faculty members in internal medicine, it was shared one resident, and uh, it was nothing for us to work. Um, 80 to 100 hours a week and because there was only two of us and, and the university only gave us three weeks of vacation uh, there was virtually no clinic off time so you worked 80 to 100 hours a week um, all year long so that provoked me finally to follow this interest in the black hole of dermatology and see if I couldn't get into uh, just a dermatologic specialty and, and hopefully have a, 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 a healthier, longer life and uh, be able to understand more things, make a difference in this area of animal skin diseases. So I did a few interviews uh, in 75 and 76 for dermatology positions and got what I have always referred to as the offer from my old alma mater at the University of California, Davis, where they offered me twice as much salary as Cornell was paying me. They offered to have me do only dermatology, which I couldn't do at Cornell at that time. Because there was another dermatologist, I only had to work clinic duty six months a year. <laughs> I hadn't had off clinic time for my whole life. Uh, they were gonna give me research seed money, mercy. I never heard of such a thing. You're gonna have your own lab. Oh my God, I've never had my own lab. In fact, folks, I still haven't had my own lab. And so there this, was this incredible uh, professional uh, offer uh, that was kind of hard to overlook. But as you always do in a family, your wife and you get together, and you say, okay, here's the pluses, here's the minuses of both places. And for reasons we might be able to talk about some other time, who knows, uh, we decided to stay at Cornell. The good news about that is uh, we got to stay in a place that would ultimately be very good to us and our family. And Peter Erke, who was looking to get out of the University of Pennsylvania, took the job at Davis. So it was a win-win. This is one of those out of focus pictures that you got back in the day when uh, you had to take your camera, it had a timer on it, and if you wanted to do a selfie, quote, quote, you balanced it on a rock or something, pointed it at yourself, hit the timer, ran over to get in the picture, and hope you got something good. Of course, you couldn't check what the picture looked like. Um, so that's my excuse for this uh, out of focus picture, but. Chris and I uh, went back for round two of the John Muir Trail in 1975, uh, two years later. Uh, went back in at Edison Lake, where we had been, and uh, this time uh, made it 50 miles. This time, Chris did great. 
this is an image at Evolution Lake on the John Muir Trail. Uh, it's about 10,000 foot elevation. And again, you can see there's nobody else but us. Just a magical, mystical, uh, very relaxing uh, experience. This time, after about 50 miles, I partially tore one of my Achilles tendons. And so we had to take our first opportunity to get out of the trail, which they don't come very often. And the only way we could get out was to pass uh, through Bishop Pass, which is at an elevation of about 12,000 feet. And so Chris hiked and I gimped my way uh, out and over Bishop Pass. Uh, again, caught a ride in a local beer truck back out to civilization and uh, went back home to lick our wounds a second time. 50 miles this time. Well, undaunted in 1977, we decided to give it another try. Isn't third time the charm? And so we hiked again back in over Bishop Pass from the other side and started down the trail. And this is Chris at the beautiful South Lake. Um, you can see we are sporting our then state-of-the-art, now museum piece, external frame Kelty packs. Still have them, as you'll see. And here we are on the uh, way to Trail Crest and uh, ultimately Mount Whitney, we hope. Chris's Kelty, mine. Chris had about uh, 35 pounds or so in her pack. I had about 50. Remember, we've got our little tube tent. We've got ground cover. We're carrying our own uh, freeze-dried food, and we're boiling water along the way. Here I am about to head up to get over Trail Crest at 13,000 feet. You can see that Kelty pack is quite the monster. <laughs> And here we are, finally, third time's the charm. We finally get to the uh, end of the trail uh, on the summit of Mount Whitney at 14,497 feet and a few inches, uh, the highest point uh, in the United States until Alaska joined the Union. And then, of course, there's this uh, uh, 11 or so miles that you have to hike down from uh, Mount Whitney to finally get to the other trailhead uh, at Inyo National Forest. And you can see my wife, my high school sweetie there uh, at the end of the trail. The outdoor experiences we had and times uh, were very useful uh, as we raised our family. We were able to enjoy a lot of outdoor special time, be it on a trail, uh, being in the woods, being on a mountaintop. And uh, this is our son, this is Travis. And uh, we're about to take off uh, from a trailhead and do some hiking in the beautiful Adirondack Mountains, which are in uh, the northern portion of uh, New York State. Just an amazing hiking, camping wilderness. This is our daughter, Tracy who uh, in 2004 informed me that she wanted to summit Mount Whitney because she was the only one in the family that hadn't. And I said, Trace, well, remember, I last did that 27 years ago, and I'm a whole lot older now, and I'm, I'm not sure I can do that anyway. As daughters do, she talked me into it. And uh, here's Lone Pine, uh, New York, or California, and that's where Tracy wants to take me. 14,000 plus feet, and you start at 8,000, so you're going over 6,000 feet up this granite edifice. It's a 21 and a half mile round trip, uh, going through again over 6,000 feet of elevation change. But I huffed, and I puffed, and I suffered, and when I got to the summit with this uh, sweetheart number two of mine, I literally fell on my knees and cried because I really didn't think I could make it. Well, now we're going to start pursuing dermatology because uh, part of the deal for me staying at Cornell was that uh, Cornell would allow me to do exclusively dermatology if 
I passed the American College of Veterinary Dermatology certifying exam. Uh, I took that in 1976 and passed it, uh, got my certificate, of course, in 1967, and then started Cornell's first dermatology service. Boy, talk about a, a special, humbling, tearful type of memory uh, in 1978. Uh, early on in my derm career, of course, I was majorly, like so many of us, influenced by two pioneers in the area, uh, Dr. George Muller, and I remember it was he that uh, started the first specialty practice limited to derm uh, in the United States in Walnut Creek, California. He was also uh, a co-founder of the American College of Veterinary dermatology as well as the American Academy of Veterinary Dermatology. And I benefited greatly from Dr. Muller's friendship and wisdom. Uh, even more so, uh, Dr. Bob Kirk, who was initially my mentor at Cornell, who became my good friend and is still my hero. The greatest veterinarian I have ever worked with and ever met. And I can go into the details of that another time. But Bob spent 33 years at the vet school. He was the president of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. He was double boarded, medicine and derm, and the president of the American Board of uh, Veterinary Practitioners. Um, and those two, of course, came together and started what most of us now refer to as the Bible of small animal dermatology. It's uh, 1969. Remember what a great year 1969 was? Well, here's another greatness. This is uh, Muller and Kirk's first edition, 1969, of the Bible, Small Animal Dermatology. This is uh, my picture in 1967 with uh, all of the diplomats. And uh, Richard Anderson back here and myself were the first to take the exam. The other folks you see here were uh, grandfathered in and, and gave the exam. And we see young versions of people like Tony Stannard, uh, George Muller, uh, Bob Kirk, uh, here's Richard Hallowell, and I could go on and on, the original Notorious 13, and then the new additions, Richard Anderson and myself. Uh, you can see something else from this picture. You can see right from the beginning, I never really fit in very well. <laughs> Somehow I don't have the look. Oh well, it never bothered me and it didn't bother them. What a great bunch of folks. In fact, professionalism would be one of those things that uh, you know, plagued me for quite a bit of the first part of my career, at least up into the mid 80s or so, this whole idea of professionalism. Well, you know, the dude doesn't look like a professional. He doesn't dress like a professional. He doesn't talk like a professional. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a, an image of me in the early 80s in our clinic at Cornell. I don't know, looks like a person to me. But in any case, uh, one of the interesting things that would happen early on in my career is um, students or residents would finish examining a new case referred in and uh, they would uh, come out, tell me about the case, and ask me to come in and, and meet people and uh, look at the animal. And uh, usually I would open the door, and there would be a couple sitting there facing me, and their smiles would just drop off of their face, and their whole face would become expressionless, and they'd say something uh, like, oh, are, are you the doctor? <laughs> and everyone would assure them that I, I was. And, and of course, we did fine. I always had great fun and great relationship with, with clients. Uh, but after five years or so, I would uh, start the same scenario, walk into this room, and the uh, owners would be looking, and their smile would get bigger. And they'd say something like, Oh, Dr. Scott, you're exactly like my veterinarian said you would be. <laughs> so 
clearly uh, the uh, practitioners in my area who were referring me cases uh, were, uh, shall we say, making the road more even and easy for all of us. <laughs> well, I had developed this uh, great interest in feline dermatology. And uh, of course, what we found in those years is there was really no place to go for uh, specific uh, cat dermatology uh, information, no uh, books about feline dermatology. So I had undertaken this personal mission to try to gather all the references on feline dermatology ever that I could find and read and put them together in some uh, digestible fashion for, for people to use and profit from. And, and I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, corroborate, uh, uh, collaborate with the American Animal Hospital Association, and they agreed to publish all this information and the 12,000 and, excuse me, 1,200 and some references that I'd accumulated uh, in, in one concise place, and it uh, became an issue of uh, one of the issues of the 1980 version of the Journal of Small Animal Hospital Association where cats finally got their due, their own, a whole storybook about them. And that was really one of the most gratifying uh, occurrences uh, in my career. Well, the, the publication apparently wasn't going to stop there uh, because for the fourth edition of uh, veterinary dermatology, small animal dermatology, Mother and Kirk, uh, 1995, I was invited to become a co-author, which of course I was happy, humbled uh, to do, uh, and try to keep this textbook going in the right direction. The fifth edition, and uh, excuse me, that the the edition we just looked at, fourth edition was 1989. The uh, fifth edition was 1995, and uh, that really ushered in um, the most um, amazing, uh, emotional uh, experience, responsibility, honor that I had ever received in, in veterinary dermatology. And that is I was invited to shepherd the Bible. Uh, Dr. Muller and Dr. Kirk were leaving. Uh, they asked if I would take over. Uh, I humbly and emotionally said, sure, I'll give it my best try. Uh, got a couple colleagues whom you know well, Bill Miller, Craig Griffin, and was uh, majorly involved in the fifth edition and the sixth edition in 2001. I found out, though, after those that uh, uh, at that point in my life, I just couldn't um, I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't survey the literature. I couldn't digest it. I couldn't put it all together like I used to. I couldn't put it into concise terms that would appeal to a student, to a resident, to a practitioner, to a specialist. Uh, I just didn't have it in me anymore. And so I told the company and my co-authors it was time for me to leave. And of course, Bill Miller took it over for edition seven. But what fun it was watching the Bible from 69 to uh, 2001. Uh, there were only 88 specific skin diseases <laughs> in 1969. Those had blossomed to uh, 624 by 2001. And we could make that number even larger if we counted as individual diseases, things like mycobacterial micro, uh, mycotic granulomas caused by different genus and species of fungi, and of course, all the multitudinous papilloma viruses that exist. The pages has blossomed from 487 to 1528. Uh, suffice it to say, I've been at the right place at the right time to watch this specialty that I so loved and enjoyed literally explode. And wow, how great was that! Oh well. Remember that other uh, prof prophetic utterance of mine, uh, no teaching and no large animals? 
Well, uh, because I was the dermatologist, of course, I, I was charged with seeing skin diseases in all God's children, whether it was a horse, a cat, a dog, a bird, a snake, an elephant, uh, a Siberian tiger. Uh, it was all me. And so I had developed uh, quite an interest and quite a bit of experience in the area. And uh, at that time, uh, prior to the publication of this text, there was no textbook uh, that you could go to for in information on large animal skin disease. So I decided to give it a try, and in uh, 1988, this uh, uh, edition of Large Animal Dermatology uh, was published. It was the first book uh, ever devoted to the skin diseases of large animals. Now that was farm animals plus the horse. Time went on a little farther, and in the early 2000s, uh, there was a desire to have uh, information that was exclusive uh, to the horse. And so my colleague, Bill Miller, and I talked about it. We certainly had a lot of experience. We certainly had a lot of visuals and uh, agreed to do a textbook uh, exclusively on uh, dermatologic conditions and the skin in general of the horse. And so this was uh, the first edition of equine dermatology in 2003, I think it was. And uh, that was very well received. And so we did a second edition in, I think it was 2011 or so. Um, yeah, there will be no more, not from me. <laughs> well, then I started getting questions. We were filling some of those voice. Hey, when are you ever going to do your um, redo your large animal derm and, and update all the stuff on uh, farm animals? And my usual response to that was, yeah, I'll do that in my next lifetime. But as time went on and I thought about it, I thought, well, heck, I have tons of images. I have considerable experience. Uh, I don't want to write a an in-depth textbook, and talk about therapy and all those things, but I would love to just share images and uh, clinical experiences and diagnostic approaches to the skin conditions of, of farm animals. And so uh, in 2007, uh, I was fortunate enough to get that information in one place and publish it as a color atlas. Well, it was also well received, and so I was invited to do a second edition, which, uh, as you know, uh, was published in 2017, I believe, wherein we updated the imagery and diseases of not only the classic farm animals, cows, sheep, uh, goats, pigs, but we added in a section on the increasing popular camelids, alpacas, and llamas. So that uh, never have to look at another large animal really didn't work for me. <laughs> well, dermatology, of course, wasn't all seeing patients and, and uh, doing some clinical research and, and getting some publications written. There was a lot of continuing education fun along the way. And I was blessed to be able to be invited to give 533 lectures around the world. Uh, I, I, was, I was blessed to be able to lecture in 40 of our 50 states in the United States of America and to lecture in 39 countries around the world. Now, I would have never visited most of those places, I'm sure. Uh, wouldn't have visited those places. Wouldn't have met so many great people. Wouldn't have had so many great sociological and environmental experiences had it not been for veterinary dermatology. That was the key. An example, uh, Chris and I uh, went to Poland in 2007, and while we were there, I wanted to take a shot at summiting uh, Poland's uh, highest mountain, Risi Peak, which you can see back in here. And that's an 8,000 foot peak with a 4,000 foot gain, it's quite precipitous and above tree line. Uh, these are a couple of beautiful lakes that are encountered on the hike up towards the summit. 
gorgeous. But when you clear tree line, it becomes granite and quite precipitous. And so the uh, organizing committee, uh, knowing that it was somewhat dangerous, and knowing that my wife had, yes, acrophobia. Can you believe a girl who's summited over 300 mountains with me has acrophobia? Well, yeah, she's a tough cookie. And so they hired a guide whose main job was to put Chris in a, um, a halter and strap her to him so that we didn't lose her on the way up and down. So this is our guide. And here's uh, Chris being encouraged up. These chains were uh, uh, pounded into the pathway in certain areas where it was really, really sketchy. There were no handholds, there were no footholds. So you could hang on to these chains and make sure you didn't fall a thousand feet to your death. And here comes our guide getting Chris uh, farther up towards the summit. And here it is, on top of the world, at least on top of the Tatras Mountains in Poland. What an amazing trip. And what an amazing host the Polish veterinarians and people were. 2016, we were invited to go to uh, Russia. And of course, had the great fortune to uh, spend time in St. Petersburg, spend time here in Moscow. This is Red Square, as you know and meet just some amazing uh, Russian people. So blessed. Well, along the way, uh, the publications piled up to 700 to include uh, 10 textbooks. Uh, if anybody had told me I'd write one paper when I got into veterinary school, I would have never believed it. Uh, I had the great fortune to mentor 27 residents in Durham and somewhere over a hundred in pathology. And of course, mentoring a resident, if you do it right and you hit it off well, uh, what you become, in fact, is a dermatology dad for the rest of their life. And I gotta tell you, that's one of the most rewarding, heartfelt, emotional things that you can become, and that's a dermatology dad. <laughs> And of course, there were those 5,000 veterinary students that I taught, even though I thought teaching was a terrible idea. Now, here's a fun fact. Uh, you may or may not know that, uh, well, you know these, uh, likely these four uh, dermatology people, Peter Erke, Bill Miller, John McDonald, Tom Manning. What you may not know is uh, I was the one that administered their uh, certifying examination to them. In the old days, just one diplomat gathered with one or two, uh, sometimes three uh, different candidates and uh, essentially grilled them for two days. Well, it wasn't always veterinary dermatology and nature and such, it, a lot of it was. But I also always had this uh, intrigue for love of music, especially classic rock and roll. And so this is my old 1959, yeah, you heard it right, 1959 Fender Stratocaster. And a much more recent vintage uh, Road Warrior amp called the Fender Frontman. I was always interested in doing more with them, but career and family and circumstances just didn't allow. Um, but uh, about 2007 or so, I met people of uh, similar interest who love classic rock and roll, who'd love to play some. Uh, none of them were veterinarians except myself. And we decided it might be fun to get together and practice. And maybe this would never go anywhere except practicing together in somebody's basement. But what if we got halfway decent and we could go out and actually play music for people and entertain people and have fun? And uh, that happened. And in 2008, we uh, took it to the streets, as the expression goes. We call ourselves the Tarps uh, because we're a cover band. We cover other people's songs to the best of our ability, 
And of course, a tarp is a structure that you use to cover up and protect many things. This is this group of uh, amigos and amigas uh, that play together. Our sax and flute player, uh, retired uh, minister and uh, also public health worker, uh, retired dentist at the keyboard, uh, retired uh, physics teacher at the high school level as a drummer, uh, a current landlord in Ithaca, uh, a current graphic design artist working at Cornell in Ithaca, and of course my lovely wife and soulmate, Chris. And by now you know this guy. We'll go out and play 40 to 50 gigs a year, usually at uh, breweries, uh, wineries, uh, private parties, uh, where anybody will have us. And uh, I often get the question, well, what, what's the most fun about doing that? And uh, the simple answer is, for us, the fun is us having fun, watching other people having fun, whether they're dancing, singing, clapping, eating, whatever they're doing. Us having fun, watching other people have fun, watching us having fun. Because at the end of the day, none of us have to do this. This is all about, we love it. It's just the most fun thing in our lives right now. What did I do up there? This was a common question I got from lay people. Uh, what do you do up there on the hill? Because Cornell sits up on one of the hills surrounding uh, Cuga Lake. And uh, pretty standard uh, university life. 50% clinical service and clinical teaching, 25% of my time devoted to clinical and or other forms of research, 25% of my time for classroom teaching, laboratories, uh, consultations by phone, email, whatever for our local practitioners, uh, dermatology service, um, continuing education, as you know, and various committees. You can't be at the university and not serve on a few committees in your lifetime. One of the interesting things was, of course, in the university system, there's a tendency to, once you become good at something or known for something, then clearly you have to move on to administration. This never appealed to me, and we could talk about the reasons when we have more time at a later date, but this never appealed to me. And uh, every year when I'd get my annual review, uh, uh, the dean would say, well, how would you like to be director of, and I'd say no. Uh, well, how would you like to be uh, assistant dean for, and I'd say no. Uh, how would you like to be the chairperson, but I'd say no. And uh, this went on for a decade or so. And finally, the 11th year or so this happened, I got asked the same question. I tried to explain it in very uh, clear uh, terms. This clearly wasn't working for me. So I decided, let's try this. You see, I'm part Cherokee, Native American. And so I looked at the dean, I said, uh, Dean, I'm part Cherokee. And what you need to know about the Cherokee Nation is it only has one chief. Everybody else is an Indian. And we're really, really happy and comfortable to be Indians. And at first he looked at me like I'd grown two or three extra heads, furrowed brow, very confused. But he finally broke into a smile and said, oh, I get it. You like being an Indian. You're happy with that. And I clapped my hands together and said, yep, you got it. And to myself, I thought, why didn't I use the Cherokee story earlier? It would have saved me a lot of repeats over a decade. Well, I retired in 2016. Uh, everybody always wonders what's coming next after you retire. Some people go back to the university and work part-time or full-time after they retire. That was never my plan. Uh, the day after I retired, well, here's uh, uh, what my plan was. My favorite t-shirt, uh, animals and nature playing music nature rock. So I was hoping that whatever I did had something to do with uh, nature and music. This was my retirement party. I designed uh, my own cake. Uh, so 
a Demodex mite, a Sarcoptes mite, and uh, as far as I was concerned, it was mighty <laughs> cool, cool being my career. Well, the very next day, Chris and I jumped in the car, drove to the Adirondacks, and did a 50-mile, five-day backpack around Cranberry Lake, which is one of the most isolated, beautiful lakes in the Adirondack Peaks area. You can see that all these years later, we'll still, we're still sporting our original external frame Kelties. Uh, we always get looks and comments like, wow, is that a Keltie? Hmm, I thought those were only in museums now. Uh, I'm surprised. <laughs> of course, on the other hand, maybe I'm a museum piece. But we had this beautiful five-day, 50-mile hike camp. Here's a portion of uh, Cranberry Lake in the dense woods of the Adirondack Mountains. Here's our little uh, backpacking tent set up uh, just before nightfall. Uh, what a trip we had. Also, about the time we turned 70, we decided, hmm, I wonder if we can still summit a 14,000-foot peak. We haven't done that for ages. I mean, we hiked and we summit small peaks, 3,000, 5,000, 9,000. But we thought, you know, let's see if we can do it one more time as a birthday present to ourselves for achieving 70. And so we went out to Colorado and targeted uh, Mount Bierstadt, which is one of the many 14,000 footers. It's about an eight mile round trip. You hike out across this boggy area and then up. Uh, this amazing mountain. This is a view from the summit where you see the amazing Rocky Mountains just as far as your eye can go. A little bit of snow still, of course, not unusual for that elevation. And here were the two old folks, the septuagenarians, huffing and puffing, but uh, controlling respirations long enough to get in one smile and a summit picture blessed to be able to get to a mountaintop at 70. Well, I'll finish with, uh, you know, the intersection of veterinary dermatology and music continues to develop in new ways. And uh, 2015, myself and uh, these wonderful folks uh, associated with veterinary dermatology, you know, Joel, and Rod, and Jimmy, and Verena, and Pat, and Barb, and David, and Mike um, got together and decided uh, we might like to put on a, a, a music concert slash dance entertainment for one of the annual uh, Durham meetings. That was catching a lot of traction. All of us had had previous music experience of some kind. And so, uh, as you may remember, we got it together. And uh, we were the entertainment for the 2015 meeting, which was very cool and especially cool because it was held in, the, in Nashville at the uh, Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. We got to play Nashville. Oh! We called ourselves the Yeasty Boys, still do. In uh, 2017, due to popular demand, uh, we played once again, uh, this time in the House of Blues in Orlando, Florida. What a great time. And most recently, uh, got the band back together again in 2019 for a uh, concert annual dinner party at the Belmont in Austin, Texas. Not bad play Nashville, play Orlando House of Blues, and play the Belmont in Austin. That's about as good as life for a wannabe musician can get. Well, I want to uh, just say I am so, so grateful to um, the World Association of Veterinary Dermatology for this totally unexpected and totally humbling Hugo Schindelka Award. I'm also so, so grateful to my veterinary home for 45 years, and that would be Cornell University. Thank you for giving me the chance to follow my dream, 
do it my way and uh, maybe make a difference along the way. I don't know what's coming up next, but I do know that as long as it's coming up with this soulmate and wife of mine for the last 55 years, whatever it's going to be is going to be really groovy. The saying, one of my favorite sayings from one of my favorite presidents from the United States of America, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years. And I'll tell you, dermatologically, I've had a lot of life in those years. So many pustules, so many crusts, excoriations, draining tracts, ulcers. How full my years have been. My sisters and brothers in veterinary dermatology, thank you for being here. I want you to stay well. I want you to stay happy. And I want you to make a difference. I love you. This is Danny, over and out.